In February 1941, a junior German general arrived at the Libyan port of Tripoli. Erwin Rommel was one of the rising stars of the German army and had been chosen by Hitler as the man to rescue his Italian ally and retake North Africa for the Axis powers. The first units of his Africa Corps were soon landed. Some 16,000 men and over 100 tanks had been diverted from the European front. The Axis forces rapidly outnumbered the British troops, depleted by the war in Greece and Crete. Rommel advanced towards the British positions at El Aghera and attacked. As the British fell back, Rommel pursued them. In a matter of weeks, the Allied soldiers had been pushed all the way back to the Egyptian border. But in the retreat, a division of Australian troops had been cut off by the Germans in the Libyan port of Tobruk. The British commander, Sir Archibald Wavell, now launched two successive attempts to relieve them. Both were fought off by Rommel's now well-encamped troops. The Germans massively outgunned the British. Their 88mm anti-aircraft guns, when used against tanks, far outranged the British. Moreover, Rommel took advantage of the wide open landscape to drive his tanks around the British forces, outflanking them time and time again. It would become his trademark tactic. The British press, half grudgingly, half admiringly, nicknamed Rommel the Desert Fox. For Wavell, it was too much. Now exhausted, he was replaced by General Claude Auchinleck. Auchinleck came under immediate pressure to try again to relieve the Allied troops in Tobruk. But he refused until his forces had been reinforced. Then, on November the 18th, 1941, he launched a major assault. Operation Crusader, as it was called, started with a lengthy armored dogfight. Again, the British tanks suffered heavy casualties. But the infantry slowly moved forward. Finally, after a month of confused fighting, Rommel retreated. Tobruk had been relieved. The Axis units fell back along the coast, all the way to their starting point, at El Aghela. Orkinlek's military command now assumed Rommel was a spent force, at least for the time being. Its units were dispersed to bases along the coast for a badly needed refit.
It was a mistake. Two months later, in January 1942, Rommel's Africa Corps was back on the attack. It quickly brushed aside the forward units of a now unprepared British army. The chase along the coast of Africa began all over again. The Allies fell back towards a new defensive line just west of Tobruk. Here, a series of defensive positions, known as the Gazala Line, were constructed. Rommel attacked it at the end of May 1942. Once again, he swung his armor around the British forces in a great outflanking movement and came in behind the British positions. But this time, the British were prepared for it and tried, in turn, to outflank Rommel. The fighting lasted for three weeks, as each side tried to outmaneuver the other. Eventually, the British were forced to retreat. Three days later, the Germans overran the Allied positions. Rommel pressed home his advantage. The British withdrawal threatened to become a rout. Finally, Ochinlek turned to face his enemy at the Egyptian village of El Alamein. His southern flank rested on the Katara Depression, an area impassable to tanks. On July the 1st, 1942, Rommel attacked again. This time, the British defences held. Rommel, with his supply lines stretched and now seriously short of fuel, was forced to give up. Now, Orkinlek attempted a counterattack. For the rest of July, the two sides pushed at each other like exhausted boxers. Churchill was furious at the lack of British progress and now visited Egypt. It was time for yet another change of leadership. Ochinlek was replaced by not one, but two generals. General Harold Alexander as Commander-in-Chief Near East, and General Bernard Montgomery as Commander of Eighth Army. The British and Axis forces had fought each other to a standstill. There was no clear winner, and the fate of North Africa still hung in the balance. Everything would now depend on whether the British could throttle the Axis supply routes across the Mediterranean. For the first months of World War II, 
the Allies had enjoyed unchallenged control of the Mediterranean Sea. Britain's oil supplies from the Middle East passed through it undisturbed, and communications with the Empire in India and the Far East were secure. Italy's entry into the war changed all that. Its naval fleet was modern and well equipped. The Italians now concentrated their fire on the strategically crucial British controlled island of Malta. The island was an important refueling base for British submarines and aircraft in the eastern Mediterranean. It had become the center for Royal Navy attacks on Italian and German supply convoys to North Africa. In summer 1940, Italy bombed it. It was the beginning of a two-year assault, which would inflict terrible suffering on the island's population. Yet for all Malta's strategic significance, Britain was caught on the hop. There were no fighter aircraft on the island to beat off the attacks. Then, almost by accident, four gladiator fighter biplanes were found in crates on the island. They were hastily assembled. The aircraft put up a fierce resistance. For three weeks, the fate of Malta remained uncertain. Then, finally, British fighter reinforcements arrived, and the Italian bombers were temporarily beaten off. But it was now obvious to the British that they had to do something if they were to keep a toehold in the region. That winter, Britain launched what it hoped would be a knockout blow against the Italian Navy. On the evening of November the 11th, 21 swordfish torpedo bombers lifted off an aircraft carrier. They swept in on the Italian fleet, anchored in its base at Taranto. The Italians hadn't expected it. Three of Italy's six battleships were crippled. Four months later, Britain struck again. The Italian fleet was again caught off guard off the coast of Greece. Italian battleship was damaged. Mussolini's challenge to the British Navy was finished. It was a turning point for Hitler, too. 
It was now clear that Italy could no longer be depended on to maintain control of the Mediterranean. It meant his supply lines to North Africa were at risk of being cut off. Germany decided to take a direct hand. In early 1941, the Luftwaffe bombed Malta. The island took another severe battery. The attacks continued, month after month. Yet the British garrison hung on. During an interlude in the German bombardment in autumn 1941, it even managed to step up its attacks on the Axis supply convoys to North Africa. Then the Luftwaffe resumed the assault. But despite the battering, the people of Malta held on. The following spring, in April 1942, they received a unique honor for the heroism they had shown under four months of devastating Axis bombardment. The island was awarded the George Cross, Britain's highest award for civilian courage. But by the summer of 1942, Malta was running short of supplies and ammunition. In mid-June, the British Navy sent convoys from Gibraltar and Egypt to relieve it. But the Germans were waiting. Just two of the 17 ships got through. The situation on the island was getting desperate. It was time for some decisive action. 